Now the notes that I have today are terrible, so, so the talk might be terrible. If by the time I got, this is the last set of notes that I made for this summer school, and uh, I was pooped by then. So we don't know how well this is going to come out. As we experience more of life, which most of us have, we change and we change inwardly and we change outwardly. Now some of the changes that happen to us or that occur in us are as a result of experience, but not all of them. Some of the change is due to the fact that the archetype of a human life is based on the archetype of the solar evolutionary creation. After a certain point in life, we are pre-capitulating the second half of the evolutionary creation. There isn't such a word as pre-capitulating, so we have to make one up because it's perfect for our uses because we are anticipating future states. In the second half of the evolutionary creation, we will be exclusively creators instead of the creatures that we have been during the first half. Therefore, if we have kept our quest for light, the light of consciousness, alive, in the second half of our lives we will be more creative and more self-reliant. Now this doesn't mean that as we get old that we're all going to be Grandma Moses or something like that, or that we're going to be uh, Picasso or Leonardo da Vinci. It merely means that we will want original thought that originates from ourselves. We want to think for ourselves. Now the second half of the evolution is going to be more about the spiritualization of matter than it is about the materialization of spirit. So we're more inclined towards spiritual things in the second half of our life. That isn't necessarily religion, but because most people only associate it with religion, you find that older people are um, more populous in religion. You go to a church and you see most of the people are older. So we want more spiritual experience, real experience. I'm at that stage where I uh, look at changes that have occurred in myself. Sometimes I take several hours and work on retrospection from the past of my life. One of the things I've noted is that I read less. I still love literature, but I'd rather think things out for myself than read. So. Currently, at the moment, piece by piece, some of the old literature books that I have, I'm giving to a homeless man, a street person. He loves reading, and I keep him supplied. I'm working up to giving him a cosmic conception. I have broached the subject, but I don't know if he's ready for that yet. Uh, <laughs> but um, nonetheless, the room that I live in is on every wall just about, floor-to-ceiling books. And in that collection of books, there's only one rare book. It's a 300-year-old book by a Swiss theologian and poet named Johann Kaspar Lavater. And it's on the subject of physiognomy. And physiognomy is reading the character from the face. What we are is, you know, what we appear. If you look in the Bible and other books, they talk about the countenance of God. 
And one of the big mistakes I made in life is when I was at Mount Ecclesia, I worked in the print shop. And there was a print there showing the heavens. And the heavens was nothing but great big faces with different uh, expressions on them. And then when you looked at it closer, the faces were made up of other faces, like there were faces that made up the eyebrow and things like that. And it was a fantastic print. And, the, you know, the plate probably got thrown away and it was never used. It was maybe, and I should have just picked that thing up because it was uh, just uh, one of the, uh, very moving to me. Now, the history of physiognomy has many impressive anecdotes. The gist of this is, is when you don't have good notes, you tell stories. <laughs> Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci was a physiognomist. And if you look at his drawings, which are owned by Bill Gates now, he has a study where he shows different animals their faces and then he shows them in the expressions of humans. There's a, I believe it's an ibis and then a human face, but the most strong is, is like a, the picture of a snarling cat and the picture of a snarling human being, and he shows how the features are very similar to each other. One of the most famous anecdotes is from an Italian nobleman in the days when they like the days of Dante when they used to uh, have fights to the death and they poisoned their enemies and things like that. This nobleman has a friend that comes to visit him. And uh, he says to the friend, how are you? And uh, the friend says, I'm all right. I just came by for a visit. And the nobleman says, no, how are you? Please tell me. And uh, the guy says, no, everything's fine. The nobleman goes over and locks the door. And he says, you have an expression on your face that is only found on the face of a man when he's about to commit an assassination. And it was true. And the other man confessed and he was talked out of it. Probably the most impressive uh, anecdote is from Lovater. Uh, Lovater had somebody come to him and say, who am I? And Lovater looked at him and he said this and he said that, you know, you, you have an intellectual occupation and you, you know, and the man says, yes, that's all true, but who am I? And Lovater looks and studies more, and he says, you're a literary man, and you write uh, fictional literature and such like that. And the man says, yes, that's all correct, but who am I? And Lovater finally looks at him, he says, I think you're so-and-so, and I read your book several months ago. And the man says, you're right. To know some... <laughs> this is before television or anything like that. It's really amazing what people can do. Now, I haven't been a good student of physiognomy, just as I haven't been a good student of astrology. I have a lot of Uranus and a lot of Neptune, and I'm a Scorpio catfish, and uh, I would rather do my own thing than be a good scholar or be a student of other people. And that means learning more by direct experience, which is very good, but it's unorthodox, and it doesn't fit in with the rest of the world. Now, in trying to learn physiognomy by observation, I've learned that there is a sensory spiritual sight. And we know from the pamphlet that we were supposed to be reading before we went on probation to the Rosicrucian order that there's a difference between clairvoyance and spiritual sight. Clairvoyance is spiritual sight with simultaneous intuition so that 
you look at something and you intuitively know what it means at the same time. That's not always true with clairvoyance. You can see things with clairvoyance and you're so startled by them that you don't know what they mean. It's like when Christ says, you have eyes, but see not. So, this indicates that we have experiences and we don't know what the experiences are. This is one of the consequences of the fall. We were never supposed to lose touch with the spiritual worlds, but we turned our consciousness so much to the external world that we lost that continuous connection with the inner worlds. And the result of that is that we make the same stupid mistakes over again and again. There's nothing wrong with making a mistake. If you make a mistake, uh, you learn from the mistake and you proceed onward. So, if you have instantaneous, uh, instantaneous intuition or simultaneous intuition, it's, you, know, you, you not only see, but you know at the same time. Now, physiognomy is very much like astrology in one of the other effects of getting older. <laughs> in that we have to be careful about what we see. We have to be careful about what we say about what we see. You know, when we see something astrologically, we can't always say it. I can remember an instance of when I was young. I was not careful. And no, fortunately, no serious psychological harm was done. But um, it was not a good thing either. About 48 years ago, I was a clerk at the uh, main post office, which was downtown. It's now some kind of office building for the city, I believe. And there's a little postal annex in there. And this was before there was automated sorting of mail. So we would sit, we'd get bundles of letters and we'd put them in different pigeonholes, sorting them uh, in that way. And in one instance, I had one of those moments where you see and you intuitively know what it means. But at that time, I had no filter. And, you know, you, you get an intuitive insight and, uh, uh, you know, you're excited. And I turned to the person working next to me and I said, you have a face that looks just like a chicken's face. And that must mean that you have Aries rising and that you are probably socially pushy. <laughs> Everyone within earshot uh, laughed and a few of them agreed. She didn't laugh. <laughs> and uh, it was only later on that I realized that it was a form of cruelty that I had uh, perpetrated. Astrology and physiognomy are alike in another way. It is that we want to read our own face just like we want to read our own horoscope. You know, somebody, very rare that somebody's new to astrology and say, uh, can you t can you tell me about my brother-in-law? They hand you their own chart because they want to know about themselves. Did you start this thing? Yes, I did. Getting a little. Uh... Now that's not an easy thing to read your own face or to read your own horoscope, because in our egoism we have a blindness to objectivity. We always want to make things better than they really are. But occasionally we get flashes of insight. And a few years ago I was shaving 
and I notice that I have these hanging flesh on either side of my jaw. And uh, I instantaneously knew that this is found more in Germanic people, and especially the Germanic people that live on an island. You take a German and put him on an island like England, and you have what the modern English are. And there's a few other things in there. So immediately I knew that I had the Germanic jowls of a moralist for either good or for bad. And a moralist is somebody who passes moral judgment on everything and sometimes prudish and things like that. It's not usually not complimentary to be called a moralist. However, you have to realize to yourself what you are and if it needs correction, it needs correction. So I plead guilty to being a moralist. However, sometimes I give that trait in me free reign. And that gives me the uh, freedom to pontificate a moralistic sermon. Uh oh, here it comes. <laughs> This was a, <laughs> I told you that this was a crazy talk with not much information in it. The moralistic sermon is, is that we have to be very careful when we are doing what we are doing. We are trying to understand the causal attitudes behind disease and limiting conditions. We are not studying the body when it's functioning well. We're studying it when it's misfunctioning. And we're not looking at the good attitudes of the person, but we're looking at the bad attitudes of the person. And in this, it is very easy to stray from the admonition given to us to look for the good. Fortunately, most of the horoscopes we are looking at are for people who are no longer living because some of the, our thoughts can affect them, especially if they are critical and judgmental thoughts. Now, we can justify ourselves by saying we're only observing what is true and the truth stands for itself. But it isn't always that way. You know, we have uh, attitudes. And some of our attitudes are not compassionate. And we don't even notice that. When you're, when, you, when you're not compassionate, you don't notice that you're not com compassionate. Fierce people don't see things like that. What we are doing, literally, is formally called judicial genethliacal astrology. And the important word to note in that is judicial. It is about judgment. Judgment is all important in astrology. It is at the heart of the three pillars of astrology. And the three pillars of astrology are observation, intuition, and judgment. Good, sound judgment. But judgment and judgmentalism are two very different things. When one is judging, one tries to be impartial. And even if we're not participating in judgmentalism, there is a tendency to identify ourselves with the truth. And it very subtly creeps in that we're looking down on bad attitudes in other people. It's easy to think that we are superior. I see it happen all the time in astrologers. You put a horoscope in an astrologer's hand and there's immediately an attitude of superiority. 
And I don't think that there's anything that can heal us from those very subtle attitudes except conscientious self-judgment, which means retrospection. The further I go on the path, I'm never, I've never been a good retrospector, but the further I go, the more important I see that it is. It's really important that we begin to see ourselves as we really are. And that's the only way we can weed out those things. All right, that's the end of the sermon. <laughs> After all of that long prologue and sermon, we're now ready to do the uh, talk for today. This is the last talk in the series, so we're going to do something a little bit different. All of the horoscopes and conditions that we have looked at have been simple and obvious. It's always simpler with when you have both the horoscope and a medical diagnosis in hand. It's easier, but it's never easy. As it has been said, every talk, astrodiagnosis is not easy. And often it is a very hard thing to do. Now there's a parallel in medicine and medical research. There are some diseases and conditions that can be descriptively diagnosed, whose cause, in what material science causes, calls a cause, is not known. And today we're going to look at a disease that is has a diagnosis, but no known medical cause. We're not going to look necessarily for the medical cause, but we are going to try to look for a spiritual cause. Now, what we're going to try to do, and I say try, that's the big word, is can't you cannot call that research. Yeah, a research is something that is very thorough and very experimental and things like that. We're going to do a little bit of comparison, but it is not research. So we, we can't uh, puff out our chest and say, well, we did some astrological research today. In studying a disease, there are varying degrees of causal security or surety, or certainty. Material science is very simple. In material science, there has to be a definite material cause, such like a bacterium or a virus or something like that. For spiritual students, there may be a number of possible different causes, and there may be a number of uh, actual causes that are antecedent to the material cause. They're pre-material, you might say. We've, we've invented another word. <laughs> uh, so, we're studying the attitudes that are before things become physical, before they become solid. Now, spiritual investigation is more difficult because... Um, you don't find only one and only cause. You may find several. And they might not always be the same for the same effect. The recording angels have many, many different ways that we can produce an effect. The other day we talked about four different ways that miscarriages could be caused in an astrological sense. The physical world, the outer physical world that we live in, is a world of limitations. The limitations are benign in bringing us to very limited experiences. In some cases, we need to learn one and only one thing. And all the limitations take away a myriad of possibilities of other things that it could be. Now, if one suffers an illness in the physical body, it has to be due to a physical agent. 
But that doesn't mean that the spiritual antecedents are the same for that uh, for that one agency. For material science, there are simple, specific causes, and uh, if they don't have such a cause, it is a matter of statistical likelihood. For example, uh, we know that so many parts per billion of alar in uh, water is carcinogenic. Now, that seems to be a reasonable approach, but the simplicity of science is such that it isn't, or they don't even want to work with uh, multiple carcinogens. Suppose the water has uh, so many parts per billion of PCBs and so many parts per billion of LR and so many parts per billion of another uh, carcinogen. Is that soup more potent? And we, the science hasn't done anything about that yet. So we're, we might be living in a lethal soup of synergistic carcinogens and not know it. Now I want to take another side trip. And I think this is valuable and helpful. Do you know what the largest car- source of carcinogens is in our, in our environment? Fabric. The laws are such that all furniture, new furniture and rugs have to have fireproofing. And the fireproofing is more concentrated in carcinogens than anything that we allow in our agricultural fields. You can obtain furniture that is made without carcinogens in the fabric, but it is enormously expensive. Uh, I don't know what you do, but uh, it's a thing to look into. Uh, I'm sure there must be somebody on the web that does something about it. You know about it, huh? I've been making it because I worked at Furniture Road for two years. And Denver Mashes. Okay. Uh, we had flippable mattresses. Oh. Uh, okay. But they had to be not too fireproof, but fireproof enough that they wouldn't yes. burn your house down. Yes. Because in California there was a child that had. Yeah. Had, so they appealed to the jury to make all bedding and all child clothing, unfortunately. Not just plain retardant, but plain group. To do that, that's why you don't get portable mattresses anymore. Because a little bit of oxygen can get in. They had to pass a test for it. They would put a torch down, downward, and if it didn't catch that good, then they applied it sideways. And portable mattress has enough oxygen there that it, it withstood it. But then when they stand back, bam, in a few minutes it would come up. Yeah. So no more flippable mattresses, and they had to be flame proof, and unfortunately, smoke, smoke inhalation would kill people. They don't burn up in bed. Yeah. But all now we have to have Yeah. Children and even pets to spend a lot of time crawling around on the floor, on rugs on the floor. You can have it custom made, though. You can have a bed custom made. Oh, yeah. Custom made. Yeah, they use arsenic, but um, it's also on clothes. Yes. Because your clothes are flammable. Um, a lot of clothes are made from oil. You know, plastics. Yeah. You buy if you buy new clothes, the first thing you do is launder them. Wash them. Yeah. All right. The disease that we're going to look at. Oh, it's all right. We use statistics in astrology also. Uh, sometimes at astrological conventions, which I don't go to, but people tell me about them. They claim it's almost like a convention of sociologists in that everybody is delivering statistical papers. Uh, statistics are helpful because they can tell us where to go with our observation and where to go with our meditation, but they're not explanations. And the explanational part of astrology is what's important and what we're, why we study it. You know, statistically, we may say that 93% of the people are not going to die by an automobile accident. Uh, When we see that, we want to know if we're in the 93% or whether we're in the 7% that is going to die by an automobile accident. 
And moreover, if it's preventable, we want to know what it is exactly in our character that makes us accident prone. So the statistics help, but we have to be much more individual than that. Now, the disease that we're going to look into today is Parkinson's disease. And we're going to look at three horoscopes, which is not anywhere near a statistical sample. And we're going to try to understand Parkinson's in individuals. And what we're going to do is not going to be deep, and it's not going to be comprehensive. We're not going to use parallels or uh, some of those aspects that Rick was talking about yesterday. That was a very good presentation that Rick gave. Um, we're going to try and understand it in individuals. And even at that, we're not going to be very deep and we're not going to be comprehensive about it. Let's be very clear about what we're going to try to do. We're not doing research, which is a much bigger thing and a much more demanding activity. But we are hopefully going to learn something new. We are not diagnosing because that requires a medical license, though we hope to learn things so that we can be helpful to healing and so that we can recognize things uh, uh, that need healing and how they can be helped. We're not going to have um, either, uh, not going to have the combination of both a horoscope and a diagnosis. We know that these people have these conditions, but even medicine doesn't know what the diagnosis is. So we're going to try and work through this all to some of the spiritual origins. First, let's look at some of the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's is a disease of the central nervous system. So when we look at a horoscope, we're going to want to look at mercury, because mercury rules the uh, nervous system. In the nervous system, Parkinson's affects the motor nervous system and not the autonomic nervous system. And the motor system is ruled by Mars, where the autonomic system is ruled by the moon. The Disease tends to make the body stiff and slow, which brings to mind immediately Saturn and Pluto, which are both very slow and stiff planets. Tremors and shakes are, and other kinds of spastic actions are involved, and so we want to look potentially to Uranus and Mercury and double-bodied signs. See, we're making a list of things we want to look at so we can try to understand what's happening in the horoscope, even for the very little that we're going to do. In Parkinson's, there is a very low amount of the neurotransmitter dopamine. And um, in some cases, it's so serious that the brain is working slowly. So the um, dopamine is strongest in the third quarter of the moon, right after the full. Uh, this is something I've taken off the net. It's poorly done, but these are... Um, when the moon is tiny? Yes. Uh, in the first quarter of the moon, dopamine is most likely to be low. Some pesticides produce increased risk of um, Parkinson's, but strangely, by the statistics, smokers have a reduced likelihood of Parkinson's. So there's something that has to do with Neptune in this. Surgery, in some cases, brain surgery slows down. Oh, we run out of them? Oh. See me after class and I'll, I'll print some more. What? They tend to stick together. Okay, yeah. 
So, um, surgery, brain surgery helps uh, by getting into the brain and slicing in certain areas. It slows the uh, slows the advance of Parkinson's quite a bit. All right, this is the horoscope. I guess I, maybe I should print more of these. We're going to be short again. More people showed up than I was expecting. This is a, a famous case of Parkinson's. While these are being passed out, I should mention that if we go down this list of uh, things that contribute to uh, Parkinson's, the strongest planet, because it's mentioned three or more times, is Mars. And my personal observation is that all the people that I've known that have had uh, Parkinson's are people who were more athletic, for example, and more martial. And uh, so, uh, so the detective work uh, helps us out in that. All right, this is the horoscope of the famous playwright Eugene O'Neill. If we look, we want to look to Mercury first, even though Mars is the, the, the what we want to look at the most. Mercury is conjoined to Venus in Scorpio, and they are square to Saturn. And that indicates definitely uh, potential neural problems. And with Saturn, it indicates stiffness and slowness. Uranus conjoins the Sun in Libra. So that indicates shakes and palsy kinds of conditions. And the Neptune Pluto in Gemini opposite Jupiter could indicate more of the same, but that's not, not a really solid thing. He's born in the second quarter of the moon, so there may be slightly depressed uh, dopamine. So far, everything looks good. But when we look at the planet that we are suspecting uh, is uh, active in uh, Parkinson's, we see Mars has only positive aspects. And this doesn't follow. This, you know, this is not what we expect. But this is the kind of thing that happens when you're studying something new. Now, it is possible that one could have Parkinson's without martial problems, but that's not very likely. The markers of uh, slowness approaching paralysis, which is ruled by Pluto, don't seem to be correct. They aren't the kinds of markers that you would expect with Parkinson's. So this had me puzzled. And so I started searching further, and when I searched further, I learned that even though he had been diagnosed with Parkinson's, when he died, they did an autopsy, and he didn't have Parkinson's. He was an alcoholic, and he had shriveled up uh, several areas of his brain, which produced all of the things. That, and these, these are the kinds of things you, you run into when you're doing something new. So the suspicion that because there's not much Mars stuff happening in here, uh, that that he didn't, you know, if if we were more confident in ourselves, we could say, oh, this person that doesn't have Parkinson's, but we don't have that kind of confidence. So he had a combination of Parkinson's and. No, he did not have Parkinson's. He was an alcoholic. The Jupiter opposite Pluto and Neptune indicates like the liver of an alcoholic and with so many planets below the horizon uh, which and many of which who uh, square Saturn it looks like he was a severe introvert he was uncomfortable with the fame that he had and he was always very uneasy and so he removed himself from society and basically drank himself to death they didn't know. See, there is no diagnosis. You, there is no germ that says you have Parkinson's. 
This is the, the cause of Parkinson's is unknown. And so uh, they, he, it fit the description of Parkinson's. So he was, so he lived his life with the Parkinson's description when he was really uh, an alcoholic with the shakes. That was that was. Seen. Yeah. Oh, well, then there was an expression there. Yeah. 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 That wasn't just. But he, some people hide that. Sure. I, before we got married, my wife and I lived in a house, and one of the members in the house was an alcoholic, a young woman who was an alcoholic. And it was so secret that, uh, Nobody knew it until finally it just, you know, you couldn't handle it all anymore. It, it was exposed and you wouldn't be surprised. You'd look in the bushes outside the front door and there would be whiskey bottles there and, and you can hide that thing. And you know, people are ashamed of alcoholism and, uh, they, they do a pretty good job of not letting the world know that they are. So this is one of the things you run into at astro diagnosis, especially when there is Neptune involved. Now this brings us to the second horoscope that we want to look at. <coughs> and this is the whole reason why I took uh, Parkinson's as something to ex experiment with investigation. This is the horoscope of somebody uh, that ha I have a very push-pull relationship. It is Muhammad Ali. Uh, Muhammad Ali was beginning his career about the same time that I was beginning uh, my study of mysticism. I loved Muhammad Ali, but I hate boxing. The only way you can win in boxing is by harming your opponent. That is a regression back to the human activity in the Lemurian epoch when we did all those terrible things when we had fights to the death and things like that it was to develop the will and it was to make us aware of the external world but to carry that into our times is a terrible travesty against humanity Mercury in this horoscope is very busy and mostly positive Mercury conjoins uh, the moon and it is trying to Jupiter and we all know how mercurial he was with his speech <laughs> uh, talked freely and was very glib about a lot of things it is conceivable that the Uranus ruled planets the Aquarian planets are sufficient to produce the shakes. Again, that the Uranus comes in that. And there are seven planets in fixed signs. And Pluto is in the first. And that may have been enough to have indicated uh, degeneration. Degeneration to the extreme. Now, Mars is important. And Mars is very strong in this horoscope, and it's in a strong square with Pluto. This is an aspect of hyper-discipline, fascistic discipline. He was a fanatic about training and fitness. Together, these two planets rule Scorpio, which is one of the most extremist signs. And he believed he was fit and by character that he could take a punch, which he, which he did. And he was fit enough to take many, many punches and still win. And he, that became part of the strategy of his most famous fights. Now, he was born one day after a new moon. And uh, that indicates he was an extremely low dopamine person. It is most likely, however, that uh, that is not the cause. 
the moon, Mercury, trying to Jupiter, uh, may have harmed him in that it gave him a confidence that was not good for him. So he was an extremist. And he didn't know when to quit. And with the fixed sign, you know, I have a friend who has a fixed sign, and he can be dead wrong, but if he gets, gets his mind set on a notion, even if that notion is wrong and can be proved to him, he will not change his mind. And Muhammad Ali didn't change his mind. He was still fighting when after every fight he would urinate blood. Now that's, <laughs> that's pretty extreme. This is more than fixed. This is fixated. So we can see then, we know now that probably it usually Parkinson is something that comes on later in life. And uh, it's some, and that's exactly the way it was with him. He was amazingly fit, but probably it was the marshal being uh, clobbered in the head many times that probably started it all. At the time when he came down with the Parkinson's, uh, there were, they didn't know about the surgery that helped to relieve the progress of the disease. Now, we have a beautiful grand trine in this horoscope. The Sun, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune are in a beautiful grand trine. But they aren't relevant to the Parkinson's disease, not directly relevant to the causal planets. None of these things was in our list. So it's good that we can appreciate these positive things because we don't want to only look at the negative things that he did himself in with. All right. We have one more horoscope to look at. Michael J. Fox, who next to Muhammad Ali is the most famous Parkinson's patient. He is now probably the most famous Parkinson's patient. Now it's very hard to understand Parkinson's without knowing the circumstances of the person's life. If we look in this horoscope, Mercury is well aspected. It finds Neptune, and Neptune is in the eighth house, and it's sextile to Pluto. And this should be very protective of the nervous system. The sun is in Gemini, and... Uh, it is trying to the ascendant, which should also be protective of the nervous system. So we have something of a mystery. Now, this is unusual because Parkinson's came on quickly. It usually progresses very slowly. And it usually progresses late. It usually comes on late in life. In this case, it came on when he was age 30. He was on, on a set a movie set, and suddenly his uh, little finger on the left hand started shaking. Within a half a month, he couldn't move his left arm. That's fast. That's really fast. Now, we could try to search out the left side of the body, but by, that, by the time we got here, I was so tired and out of it for making notes that I didn't get that far. The stiffness increased, and it became rigidity. It was a rigidity in the face, so that the um, face was almost like a mask. It would be stuck with uh, one uh, uh, with one attitude on it or one expression. Now. This is something that here we get it when you start getting into astrology and try to dig these things out, you have to do a lot of work. 
since it's the ascended, it points, uh, since it's the face, it points to the ascended. There is what is called a distributed horoscope. And the distributed horoscope is where you take the, um, always take the ascendant as being the face and not just Aries. So you have the natural horoscope with the Aries ruling the face and head and such, and then you have the distributed where the first house indicates that. And this points to the conjunction of Mars and Uranus, who rules the ascendant, being opposite the ascendant. And Mars is exactly opposite the ascendant. And we can do this kind of thing because the data for this horoscope is grade A data. We know that the uh, uh, birth time has to be within a minute or two. So we can trust that uh, Mars opposite the ascendant exactly is likely there. So the, the ascendant indicates not only that it would show in his face, it indicates that it would come on early in his life. And most people do not know that Michael J. Fox, uh, they only know him as an actor. That's not what he wanted to be. He wanted to be a professional hockey player. He never graduated from high school, but by the time he did leave high school, he became famous for his acting while he was in high school. But before he left high school for his acting career, he had already had 56 stitches in his face. Now, if that isn't Mars opposite the ascendant, uh, there's no doubt anymore at, at, at that point. Now, you can't say that extreme athletic endeavor is associated with Parkinson's, but it, it's likely, I find it a lot, my neighbor around the corner died of Parkinson's, and he was extremely athletic. He was always bowling or softball or something like that, and it was extreme. Mars is sextile the sun, and Mars rules surgery, and Michael J. Fox has had the surgery, and it has slowed down the process of Parkinson's. If you look on the Internet, he has a whole, there's a Michael J. Fox Foundation, which uh, researches into the disease. Now, Mercury is trying to Neptune, and it shows the fact, that shows the fact that medication has slowed the progress. His uh, foundation is very, very strong on using L-DOPA to bring up the dopamine to slow down the progress of Parkinson's. But Neptune forms other aspects. It is square to Jupiter, and it's opposite to Venus and the moon. And Venus and the moon together are sweet water. And at the time that he came down with Parkinson's, he was, his pro, the program, one of the programs he was in was sponsored by Diet Pepsi. And he became an addict of Diet Pepsi. He drank many cans or bottles of Diet Pepsi every day. And Diet Pepsi is loaded with aspartame. And aspartame, again, we don't have a smoking gun, but there are statistical correlations between aspartame and Parkinson's disease. So we can see that there is something physical by the extreme blows to the head and injuries to the head and that there is something in his attitude where Neptune is the planet of addiction and that fixed, that's a fixed sign T-square and that sweet, sweet water is in Taurus. So it's not surprising that, um, uh, that he should have that kind of problem. In fact, the... Uh, Aspartame interferes with uh, the use of dopamine or even the production of dopamine in the body. So this is, this is pretty good. Now there is a maxim in uh, mysticism that says fast is slow and slow is fast. 
The people who would take heaven by storm retard their progress sometimes indefinitely. Instead of trying to advance by force, which is a misuse, it is a martial uh, misapplication, or trying to act in haste, which is a mistaken use of mercury, if we work persistently and consistently, and if we live lives of finesse, we are mystics. We are meant to live finesseful lives and not brute force lives. My own life is a textbook example of that. I have a football injury, and every time I have uh, re-injured it or any major injury that I've had in my body, it's always what I'm trying to do something by force instead of finesse. And I think something like that is uh, the lesson that Michael J. Fox is learning. We want to say something positive. We want to say that he's learning the lesson because he's a living man and our thoughts influence him. We can't just judge him and say, hey, you, you, gotta, you, you can't speed yourself up with all of that Pepsi. <laughs> all right, there's a lot more that I uncovered, but by now I was uh, almost a blathering idiot from working on notes. So uh, that's as far as I went, and that's as far as these astrodiagnosis talks are going to go. And so we'll close with the Rosicrucian student's prayer. O oh God, increase our love for Thee, so that we may serve Thee better from day to day. Let the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in Thy sight, O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. What? They go into the brain? The brain thing? Uh, it, that, again, that's one of those things. It brain uh, the, the brain surgery? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I, I looked into it a little, little way. I don't know. I, I, I don't know whether it is uh, whether they separate in the capsis collapsum like they do for other things. I don't know if that's the case. I just know somebody that had that. Uh, they have a battery pack uh-huh. battered in their uh, front of their chest, and then there's wires, and then there's electrodes that stimulate the brain. This oh, okay. Was totally debilitated with Parkinson's. Now he's just very a little slow. Okay. And speaks. If you if you can get a horse go for them, it'd be interesting for me to look look into it. Okay, I'll try. Okay. There's also a group of people, and it's going nationwide, that is dancing dancing for Parkinson. That they found that if they take Parkinson's people and teach them dance moves, you know, the right brain, left brain, mm-hmm. stuff, that not only does it give them a social community, but it also changes makes them more able and oh. more stable. So we have St. Parkinson's dance. <laughs> <laughs> well, in your research, Richard, did you, uh, Robin Williams had something called Lewy body dementia, which I think is Parkinson's related. Yeah. Uh, did you come across anything like that? No. Uh-huh. But there has been something, there has been a major discovery in physiology. Physiology, they they think they know every cell in the body almost. But in the last month, they have found out and published it, and the the article I read said they're going to have to re... I go to Science Daily, and they give you all the latest uh, papers that have been published. And this paper says they have now found a lymphatic system for the brain. And there are little tiny lymphatic tubules that run through the brain. And they're, they're thinking that uh, in the case of, uh, uh, what is it, Alzheimer's and the disease we talked about last night, that, uh, that the drainage isn't there. And uh, with, when the drainage isn't there, that this is what causes a buildup. And you can see if there are little tiny vesicles and there are blows to the head, that that, that could mess something like that up. Mullen tea. What? M U L L E I N. Mullen. Okay. Okay. <laughs> 
Okay. So you were saying that Parkinson's has symptoms similar to uh, alcoholism? Yes. In some cases of alcoholism, the person gets the jitters and they get the shakes and everything slows down for them and they even have a hard time walking. And in those cases, it's been found that the uh, brain shrivels and shrinks. And that was what the case was with Eugene O'Neill. Yeah. And so from that's, see, when it comes to diseases where there isn't a bacterium or a virus, uh, medicine isn't quite as good at diagnosis as they are when they have. And so there is no no diagno, There's no there's no germ here as a as a smoking gun. And the same thing with alcoholism. Good. Thank you. Yes. The only thing I've noted is the sun. Because when the sun is in the initial degree of a sign, the developmental period of the first 28 years is the same as the basic nature. So, like, you're developed according to what you are. But if you're born with the sun in the last degree of a sign, then you're, you know, it's like, suppose, like 29 degrees of Taurus. You're, you're, you're put into school where everything is Gemini, it's quick and fast and zip, zip, zip. And those people suffer some because their basic nature is not in concord with the uh, uh, astrological environment, environment that, that ensues right after birth. There's probably a reason for it. Uh, my first guess would be that if somebody has the uh, 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 sun in the last degree or last few degrees of a sign, it's meant that they're supposed to be going away from those qualities and learning something new and might as well get them while they're young. And so the uh, recording angels would put them in the birth in that kind of a way. No. We got a long time for dinner yet. <laughs>